first of all, in case you haven't heard, and I'm sure everybody did, but uh, we did uh, claim second place in America's Best Communities competition. <laughs> It was a $2 million grand prize. Uh, we're thrilled to get it. Um, we don't have the check yet. Um, for, for, for those who are wondering, the check actually doesn't go to the city. It goes to a uh, bank account that is managed by the ABC team. So there's 49 on the ABC team. And uh, it will go under the uh, Partnership for Economic Development because the monies had to go to a nonprofit organization. And we will be meeting next week um, to talk about one, a celebration for the community, but more importantly, uh, how we will ultimately uh, expend those funds for the projects that the community said they wanted. The three projects, primary projects, are the downtown catalyst project the eco environmental center and number three is the co-location center for entrepreneurs two million doesn't cover any of those individually but we will depending on how each one the timing works is how we'll probably move the money into that um, and right now one of the things we really want to do is begin putting together the marketing materials for the downtown project because that is really going to be done between the city and a private developer a public private partnership that's the most effective way uh, we will take care of the plaza portion but we don't want to really have anything to do with um, uh, building a building and renting it out and all the rest of that that's not really what cities are for so we'll we'll get a private developer for that so we're uh, thrilled to, to have that uh, behind us uh, Charlie will tell you that we were very nervous um, you know got everything all said and done and then when it's time to um, you know find out the names you start to get butterflies it was funny because we wanted it to be over immediately but then as you get close it's like Oh man, maybe they ought to think about it a little bit longer. You never know. But Statesboro, Georgia got third, um, and we got second, and Huntington, uh, West Virginia got first place. So we, uh, we were thrilled to see all the, the teams again. All of them had great plans, really great plans. Um, but unfortunately, there could only be three winners out of those eight. And so we, as I said, we were happy to get it uh, I, and I actually got um, uh, Vince Gill's autograph on the the winning card uh, so uh, that was worth that was worth at least uh, a million <laughs> so uh, and of course they play they they did the usual joke you know and the winner is La La Land you know so <laughs> but uh, it's uh, now done and now the real work uh, begins um, I also want to congratulate uh, four individuals that uh, went on the honor flight back to Washington, D.C., Korean War veterans. Um, they were Bill Sullivan, Russ Muscari, uh, Gene Burns, and Charlie Marquez uh, went back. And uh, the, they also had uh, escorts along with them to uh, to go back to Washington, D.C. This is, they call it an honor flight because it is quite an honor. And uh, so I congratulate uh, those four individuals and thank them very much for their service. We're uh, very, very proud of them. The um, other things going on, uh, and then we're gonna open it up for uh, whatever questions you might have. The uh, hotel down at the English Village is moving along quickly. It's in uh, plan review right now. Uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, construction going along right along the channel. Uh, that's where they're um, doing all the new landscaping, pavers, etc. I'm getting a lot of comments from visitors um, that, you know, I can't believe you let it go into such disrepair and, you know, there's debris everywhere and I have to send them back an email that says, no, that's called redevelopment. That's, it's not disrepair, you know, we can't do that all in one night at midnight, between midnight and 2 a.m. This is going to take weeks. 
because they're putting in trees and lighting and pavers and new chain and bollards along the channel. It's going to look absolutely beautiful. Um, so they're, and they're excited uh, about getting that hotel started. Um, Cyprus is moving along. We're beginning the plans again for uh, Sarah Park. Uh, so everything is uh, going as planned. We had a budget work session yesterday. Um, I am pleased to say on one of the things on the budget, um, because I've had many requests for it over the years, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and announce it. Maybe I'll put pressure to make sure it happens. Uh, <laughs> um, Thanks, the um, yeah the tran our transit system as you know for years when we were less than fifty thousand people we had a uh, kind of the, well, I guess I call it a station to station transit system well the moment we went over fifty thousand people we lost the majority of our federal funding which made that impossible uh, we tried it was going to be a million dollars a year to serve about 300 regular riders. It made no sense whatsoever. So we went to what's called Havasu Mobility. It's a, a service curb to curb, eight to two, uh, Monday through Thursday. And um, the ridership is now slowly building on that. People are realizing it's there and available. Well, uh, we're gonna move it eight to five, Monday through Friday. So I think that's gonna be um, really helpful to a lot of different folks and uh, we, we believe that it's still going to cost uh, taxpayers some money um, it's, it'll probably run between three and four hundred grand a year but we um, we believe it's it's money well spent because we're seeing the ridership go up you know one of the reasons a lot of people will ask me well why don't you keep with the regular transit system with the the bus stops and whatnot the reason we don't hear is just it's not effective. You you talk to people, and I've I, I wanted to ride the bus, and one of the things that I noticed was it took me, you know, ten minutes or whatever it is to get to the bus station. Then I waited another 20, 25 minutes, got on, and got to where I ultimately got, and I could get in my car and get there in eight minutes. And that's why we don't have regular ridership other than those who have no other way to get around. And so having curb to curb is even easier for them because now they're not walking in 110 degree heat or waiting at the bus stop and whatnot. So, you know, we're not like a normal city where, you know, you've got bus stops every corner and, you can, and the traffic's so bad everywhere else that it's easier to get on the bus. We don't have those dynamics, so it just, it wasn't working and we tried all kinds of different things and none of them uh, really improved the, the ridership. So we're hopeful that this will do it um, and uh, that people will enjoy it because I, we all get that, you know, doctors also work on Fridays and, and um, people need to get where, where they need to go. We're also exploring, and I won't say that we're gonna have it, um, a route that would go maybe one day a week out to the mall something like that. Oh, so, I was afraid you were going to announce commercial air service and an, and, <laughs> yeah. an Olive Garden and a Trader Joe's. Yeah. Uh, that, that'd be at the next June meeting. <laughs> uh, no, we're not and getting not any of those. Happen, by the way. Don't let them leave this room. Settle for an Yeah. 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 So, um, and in terms of the rest of the budget, it, it while it's a, it's a large budget, it's pretty much determined by the, the Havasu Vision 2020 revitalization plan. We're going to stay consistent because that plan was built by the community. We're staying consistent and when, when it comes to actually spending money on uh, construction projects and whatnot, other than the normal things you got to do, uh, streets and water and wastewater, um, so uh, th those we obviously need to continue to, to replace and refurbish. Um, I'm, uh, one of the questions I asked uh, yesterday was uh, about our wastewater, our, our sewer uh, rates. Um, you may recall that we refinanced it um, uh, about almost three years now. Um, and with the whole idea is uh, to make it more equitable for everybody 
because it was uh, the debt was front loaded, and that meant the people living here today were going to pay the vast majority of the sewer construction bills, and we didn't think that was fair at all. So we went to the uh, we couldn't get much help from the state agency that's supposed to help us, and so we went to the public markets and we refinanced it. Uh, all of our debt over a 30-year period, well, except for one piece of debt is 20-year. But, um, and what it said was that we wouldn't have to raise rates until like the year 2022, 2023. And so yesterday I asked, are we on track for that based on all the projections we made? And the answer is yes. So um, not too many places in the United States can say their uh, sewer utility rate won't go up for at least 10 years. In fact, the last time we raised a rate was 2010. So that would be something like 12 to 13 years. So that refinancing um, worked. We took advantage of the low rates. And uh, we're now paying off that debt. And everybody is sharing equally, including any new residents that come in. They get to share in that as well, as opposed to they get the free ride and we get to pay for it all. So that was. Uh, good news there. And um, other than that, the budget uh, was pretty, pretty cut and dry. And uh, so we should be wrapping that up uh, over the next uh, month or two. The, or actually, next month. Um, one of the things, before I forget, because Jerry will remind me later, too, as well, our next coffee with the mayor and city manager is June 2nd. And it will be at, um, it's called Sam's Place. It uh, used to be Uncle Kenny's. So it will be there. We're gonna, it's, a, it's new, we're gonna give it a, give it a shot. And so we're looking forward to, to doing that. Is it by Golden Corral? It is by Golden Corral. Yeah, yeah, that's it. They've got the new outdoor section, maybe we told it out there. On uh, June 2nd, probably not. <laughs> not this time in the morning. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Could you give us an update on the Havasu Riviera? Oh, um, things are going pretty well there. We finished the road piece of it. Um, they're waiting on the uh, 404 permit from the Army Corps of Engineers so that they can start their own construction. I'm told that they have had a tremendous amount of interest in the residential piece as well as the commercial piece. So um, we're pretty excited about it. Um, we're, we're seeing our commercial um, submittals for permits. I wonder if the air conditioning is getting really hot. It's in getting warm in here. Huh? Yeah. The, uh, the, the, it's going, the, those permits are going, well, it says 82, I wonder. Oh, it just can't keep up. Um, so anyway, we're getting a lot of commercial permits. In fact, one of the things we talked about yesterday was trying to find um, some temporary help to get through all the permitting and uh, permit reviews, uh, et cetera. The, so we're gonna explore some things because um, uh, we we're a little behind on all of the, the construction activity that's taken place. Uh, that's about that. Have you started to put any of the infrastructure in, like the sewer, the road, or anything like that? It'll be after July. That'll be in, the, in our next fiscal year, which begins July 1. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be putting in the wet infrastructure and the buried infrastructure in anticipation of uh, paving the road, putting in the uh, gutters, sidewalks, all that stuff. Jim. What is the website again to get on to see the drone and how it advances? Desert Land Group um, the, uh, or um, HavasuRiviera.com. I'm not sure. Uh, they, I mean, the, the private developers have their own website. I believe it's HavasuRiviera.com. Uh, and Desert Land Group is, um, is kind of their engineering design group that's working with them, the, the Comic Enterprises. They're the ones that are doing the drone work and all of that. So Desert Land Group, uh, they, they have a website as well that probably has all that footage. Okay, um, so let's um, let's talk trash for a little bit. <laughs> um, Charlie brought this in. This is the 96-gallon can. Um, 
But before we get into a lot of questions, let me kind of just give you some background of why we're doing what we're doing and why it's probably not going to make a whole lot of difference to you. The, um, our landfill um, is um, getting toward the end of its uh, natural life, so to speak. And we're trying to extend the life of our landfill because at this point, we don't even know if we can get a replacement. That's something we have a, a consultant that's helping us right now determine whether or not we even have another alternative once this thing is filled. Um, if there are no other alternatives, uh, we'll be like many other communities where they literally have to ship our trash out of town somewhere. And that gets very, very expensive. So what we're trying to do is extend the life of the landfill as long as we can. And one of the ways you can do it is through the new system that we're proposing because <clears throat> studies have shown that when you get the new recycling cans and you give it to everybody in the community, your recycling goes up by a factor of four. So that's huge. Um, and because a lot of people in town don't have never asked for those little blue bins, um, etc. So what will happen is that everybody in the community will have these delivered to them. Two of them. Two of them. There'll be this one uh, for regular trash, and then a, a recycling bin. Now, one of the things that we've also asked the public to do is that if for some reason, after trying these out, any, somebody feels that they cannot deal with the larger can, although it will not weigh any more than a 35 gallon can, because you move the contents from that 35 gallon can into this one, it doesn't weigh any more. It doesn't suddenly become heavier. Um, this one's actually easier to maneuver than the ones you can buy. But w if somebody feels that they cannot handle it, they have purchased 1,065 gallon cans. Um, that would be an alternative. But what we're telling everybody is that this is a semi-automatic system, which means that if you're used to just taking two large bags of trash and putting them on the curb, you can still do that. Nothing has changed. All we're asking is that people give these a try because it will be better in the long term for filling up landfill costs, all the rest of it. Closing that landfill, um, our guess is five to eight million dollars. Getting a new one, who knows? So, because um, I get a lot of questions, well, my neighbor is from California and he comes here on weekends. What's he supposed to do? The trash pickup is Wednesday. I go, what do they do now? Well, they put two can or they put two bags out there. Well, they can still do it. Nothing has changed. You can, well, I've got, um, I've got uh, shrubbery and trees and, and I, I put some twine around it and I put it out on the curb. Now what am I going to do? Well, you're going to put twine around it and put it on the curb. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed other than we're asking people to give these a try. Over time, we have, most communities have found that these are the easiest way to go. The wheels on them are, are the other thing I get is, well, I have to drag it through uh, gravel. Well, what do you do now? I, I, my, I, it's only 35 gallons and I put it, pull it through the gravel, but I don't know how I'll do this big one. Well, this is a self-balancing can and the wheels are about six times what you get, on, and the big wheels are much easier to pull than those tiny little things that get stuck in the gravel. So overall, we really believe that this is going to, to work very well. It's worked in every community that has tried it, but I think the difference for ours is that we still will have unlimited trash. And uh, for those, by the way, who um, and as I think I explained this before, and I got a call yesterday from a lady that um, was in a wheelchair and she says, well, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. And I said, well, it's going to be even easier for you because you can call up. They'll put you on a list 
And as long as that can is sitting at the top of your driveway or whatever, the driver will actually run up and get it, put it in the front loading bin, put it back to where it's at. We're trying to uh, make it as efficient as possible for the community, the um, and the operators and the operators themselves. Um, I don't, I, I don't know that I would want to have their job in the middle of the summer. <laughs> That's a pretty tough job. So that if uh, if we even got a half or two thirds of the community that went to fully automated, where they're the truck just comes out and throws, you know, the trash is going to be picked up quicker, uh, everything. They, what they plan to do is that um, the driver actually will do the recycling first, I believe it is, or is it the second? Okay, the trash first, and then the same driver will come and get the recycling. The, um, but anytime we can prevent that driver from getting out of the truck, all the better but you know what if somebody just can't do it they can't do it and it's that option is absolutely available to them um, should be fairly easy <coughs> I was uh, on my reach article regarding trash and landfills and they were the college boys that are doing it are finding that about 60% of the trash that they get in the landfills is paper and paper products and that's what's clogging up the landfill. Do we, is there any thought to reducing that amount of paper going into the landfill? Absolutely. It seems like the recycling of, uh, that we're doing is primarily plastic can, glass, and that type of thing. The paper's left alone. Did, did you want me to answer? The recycling bin is the same, the exact same bin as the trash bin. The, right. the, the lid is a different color. Right. But it's the same uh, bin. So instead of the little 15 gallon or 10 gallon, whatever it is, the trays, no the bins that we have now, on the recycling bins that, that you're going to get, um, it, you can put your cardboard in there, your paper, oh. your junk mail, paper your. Recycling. In fact, in, in, in my opinion, if in doubt, put it in the recycling bin. Because what, what happens is it's what's what they call single stream recycling. So now they, they do, do the sorting out there at the curb, yeah. which obviously is not a very efficient yeah, process. So single stream, um, it, it all goes into a, 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 a baler. They take, the, they take the recycling, they just dump it into the truck, the same truck that they took the trash, already took the trash to the landfill. They bring the same truck back, run the same route to pick up the recycling so that truck now is full of recyclables, ostensibly. So that truck now goes to the facility where that truck e empties into a baler. They bale up that recycling, they put it into a semi-tractor trailer rig and they take it to Las Vegas, where it goes into a huge facility that we have, we've toured. And uh, that's where it all gets sorted and, uh, and recycled. So, it, like I said, if in doubt, put it in the recycling bin because it's going to end up going to Vegas anyway. And even yeah. if even if there's some trash in there, it, 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 we'll let them dispose of it in Las Vegas. Either way, it doesn't go into our landfill here. <coughs> Chuck. Yeah, uh, in Los Angeles, there's places there that don't have landfills, and they have. Stations where the trash trucks go to, and then they have to unload there, and it goes into a semi, and then it's hauled all the way out to Riverside or right. Inland Empire. And that you know what? That you talk about a cost of trash. Uh, that, to, uh, that's to what we're trying to avoid. Trash. Yeah, that's why, why that's why we're doing this is so that we we can avoid that, or at least push that down the road as far as we possibly can. Yeah, exactly. Be um, and some people have asked us about cost. Um, we were initially thinking about um, having Republic Services bill separately for the trash. And one of the reasons was, and we've talked about this before, about the expenditure limitation that the city is under uh, because of the state law passed back in 1980. Well, the more we looked at it, the more difficult we felt that was. So uh, we've asked 
our finance person to reconsider that and actually keep the billing here and we'll deal with the expenditure limitation and not in other in another matter so what does that mean to your billing we're expecting the cost will go up 40 cents that's it 40 cents a month Thank you. i've talked to several people about this they all complain they wrote the street says who's going to bear the cost of all these new trials a lot of says they're going to raise our prices i said from what i understand it's going to go up a buck a quarter yeah now it's going to and well see it was no, going to go up a buck 40 and a dollar was of that was billing now we're going to keep the billing and it's going to go up 40 cents and and one of the reasons you know and some and i've heard the same thing well it's got to be more than that because they're buying new trucks and whatnot well if they're more efficient they have less labor costs to help offset it and, and they, they and they they need to replace they need to replace those trucks anyway. Yes. If you look at the Republic trucks running around the streets now, I mean, take a good hard look at them. You know, we tend to ignore them over time. Uh, the other day I was passing one going the, the opposite direction and I realized just how shabby those trucks are getting. And, and talking to the, the, the manager here, he says, yes, we, ha we have uh, virtually all of our trucks in our fleet. They have 11 trucks in their fleet here. Virtually all of them are way over their maximum life expectancy, and they're ha they're looking at having to replace engines in those shabby old trucks, and that's a that's a sixteen thousand dollar venture in itself. So, so we need to replace the trucks anyway. Uh, they spoke to corporate. Corporate is all in favor of completely replacing their fleet with brand new trucks. Which, if you're an operator in one of those trucks in the summertime here, you'll be glad to know that they're air conditioned and and they're they're set up with the automation. They still have the front bin loader. They're not complete automation. This, this hook on here is made for another system uh, that, that is a side loader that's designed just to pick up this and, and load, uh, dump it into the top of the truck. These trucks still have the front bin like what they have now. That's, that's so that if somebody can't use one of these or won't use one of these, the guy can still get out of the truck, or the person, I should say, the operator, can still stop the truck, get out of the truck, and handle that trash manually the same way they do it now, by tossing it into the bin on the front of the truck. The difference is that now the, with these trucks, the bin on the front of the truck has a, uh, a robotic arm on the side of it that can come out and grab this can and dump it into the bin on the truck. <laughs> yeah. Watch your coffee there, Mary. Uh, could grab this bin, this um, this cart, and dump it into the front loading bin on the truck, as opposed to taking this cart all the way to the top of the truck and dumping it into the top of the truck. So this is a, a bit of a modification from what uh, automation people are familiar with, maybe in other communities, uh, and certainly that that would be an impediment here because our community is different enough to warrant this kind of hybrid, semi-automated system. Uh, that's that's going to going to go into effect. So new trucks, happier operators, uh, and Republic will tell you, I'm sure, that they're having trouble recruiting and keeping operators, um, and uh, for obvious reasons. So so the the safer and um, uh, uh, better they can make conditions for their operators out in the field. Certainly, that makes for a happier company, and uh, makes for better service ultimately. And if you need another incentive, it doubles as a coffee table. Oh my goodness. Wow. Well, we don't want that here. So this, you know, we, we hear a lot about these these huge cans, and and frankly, it. I mean, I just picked this up and put it in the back of my suburban. It's it is. This is not a dumpster like a lot of people I think have in have in their minds. Yes, it's big, bigger than what most of us have in our garage now. But when you look at the footprint, you know, and I'll use my I'll use my own circumstance as an example. I've got two 45 gallon trash cans and my recycling bin along the wall in my garage, just inside the garage door. Same condition that a lot of people in town have. 
the footprint, I mean, having two of, just two of these instead of the three pieces that I have now, replacing the three pieces I have now, the actual footprint is about the same. Um, this, again, this is, this is not a, a big heavy thing that is totally un, unwieldy. Like the mayor said, the, the wheels are bigger, they're wider, it's easier to maneuver. Uh, the top is squared off. It's designed, well, obviously the lid is attached, so this isn't going to blow away in, in a wind. It's designed to withstand a 30 mile an hour wind just standing here empty like you see it now. Uh, if it does get blown over, the top is squared off, so it's not going to go out there and roll around in the street like a lot of the cans that we have now. So, and if this gets blown over anyway, um, I mean, that's a stiff wind, and I don't care what you got out there, it's probably going to blow over. So it, this, you know, these, most of what the objections that we hear is about the can itself. And so that's why I brought it. And in fact, I think I'm just going to take this with me everywhere I go. <laughs> and and, uh, and just so everybody can just you know, see it and feel it and, and not be afraid of it. I think the other thing, too, is this, with this system, it's you know, people put their trash cans out without lids because they don't want their lids full of Well, the coyotes get in. Right. No trash all over the place. Right. I think this is, these are going to be more coyote proof, I believe. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, you want to allow them to shoot coyotes instead of the tap out pigeons. If they should, oh, yeah. if, if they should be but not timely in, but not by gunfire. Not by gunfire? Not by gunfire. Uh, I get 40 or so freeloaders. I'm not going to. They live on my solar panels. That other day. Yeah. yeah. If they, if they disappear, I didn't hear anything about it. <laughs> you can't recycle a pigeon, though. Uh, a neighbor of ours put us on to the fact that there is a huge, huge dumpster uh, behind the surgery center. Uh, and our understanding was that it's a collection point for newspapers. We've been saving our newspapers for years, and we dump them there, and the scouts benefit. Hmm. I wasn't well, aware of it. Right yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know anything about that. Yeah. Well, you'll, you know, you'll be able to use the recycling bin for your newspapers now. Of course, the, the scouts won't get the benefit of that. But, uh, yeah. Other questions? Go ahead. Just out of curiosity, if I uh, just driving around town, there's so much building going on. Uh, how much are building permits up in numbers? This year over the last years. Um, great question. We actually do um, give a report every council meeting. Residential, I want to say, is up around 25 or 30. Yeah, 20, I think 22 percent. Um, the, the numbers of permits uh, is, is one thing. Yes, those numbers are up, but the, it's the value, you know, what those, those permits represent. And over the, over the same period last year, we have about $10 million worth of value associated with those permits higher than, than we did during the previous year. So that's, it's, it represents about $36 million worth of improvements, which is about $10 million higher uh, than the previous year. Yeah, there, there's no doubt, um, even after the winter visitors have left, that traffic is still pretty high compared to what I'm used to over the years. Um, we're becoming uh, more and more popular, uh, there's no doubt about it, and uh, frankly, uh, you know, we hope that with the Vision 2020 revitalization plan, that will continue and we'll be able to add a lot more amenities. Norm. Speaking of traffic, are we going to anywhere getting we're close to getting any of our earth funds back? <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, generally speaking, no. However, in the budget this year um, that was just passed, I think, last night, um, they are going to give $30 million back to cities and counties. Uh, uh, they call it HERF restoration. Well, it would take 150 million to restore Earth um, in one year, but they're going to give us 30 of it. They, they've been sweeping somewhere between 90 and 100 million every year 
for the last 15 years. Um, so they'll give us $30 million of it back. Um, we do see a trend of legislators saying, you know what, shouldn't we be balancing our budget by with the, the, own, the money we have and not somebody else's money? So that, because originally that HERF restoration wasn't in the budget and the legislature put it in. So that was good news. And that 30 million isn't just for housing? Oh no, 30 million isn't. We get a very, we'll get a piece of it, but. Maybe 120,000. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's small six figures, but it's still not, but it helps. I mean, every little bit, you know, helps. It gives us another two or three, four miles that we can restore. Um, the other thing that um, was proposed in the budget that we, as cities and towns fought pretty hard, and fortunately the legislature agreed to us, was um, there was a proposal by the governor and with support by the universities um, where um, basically that, um, where the cities and towns would have to participate to the tune of six plus million dollars a year to help universities bond. Um, the problem with it was, it isn't that we are against universities. In fact, we love our universities and we're doing everything we can to help ASU here locally. But this proposal was that every time a construction project is done by a university, that they would get all their construction um, transaction privilege tax, some people call it a sales tax, um, they would get it back. And their argument was, we're only one of six states where universities are paying that tax. Well, guess what? Cities and towns pay that tax too. It's not a sales tax. It is a transaction privilege tax. That's what Arizona has. So technically what that means is that the uh, seller doesn't have to pass that on to the consumer. Doesn't have to. But they got to pay it. So that's why they pass it on. Um, so we said, look, those monies normally go back to cities and towns to pay for primarily public safety. Two thirds of our budget is public safety. And if you start taking it away, um, then what's the next state agency that says, well, it worked for them. We'd like to take a little bit more we reminded them that you've got to quit having these programs and where you aren't willing to pay for them. Yet you go and find somebody else to pay for them. And typically cities, towns, and counties are who they look to to pay for it. Believe it or not, a couple of years ago, and you probably don't know this, there's a state, agent called, state agency called the Arizona Department of Revenue. That's always been a state agency and they are responsible for paying for it. Well, now you're paying for it. We have to kick in so much money every year um, to help pay for that state agency. A few years ago, they tried to do that with the Department of Water Resources. And you probably saw for about a year or so, you had an additional $2 charge on your water bill. We don't even use the Department of Water Resources, but we had to pay for it. Um, so. We're now seeing the legislature starting to say, you know what, we've got a $9.8 billion budget. You'd think we could balance it. And um, so we're, uh, they are going to do something for the universities that are not sure what, but it looks like it will be an appropriation out of that $9.8 billion. That's the way it really should work. Um, because we were, our concern is that that $6 million bucks that wasn't just one year. That was forever. Six million dollars a year forever. And quite honestly, when we calculated it, it wasn't six million dollars. It probably was double that number when you really go through the numbers. So in 10 years, that would have been one point, or that would have been 120 million dollars. Well, um, million here, a million there. Yeah, you know, we, we, we have our, every city in town has their own budgets. We have to balance it. We can't 
go someplace else and say, well, we've got this agency, how, how about you paying for it for us? So, um, but we're, as I said, uh, the point of that conversation was that the legislature, I believe, we're starting to see a shift of them saying, you know what, we need to be responsible for our own budgets. Cities and towns are responsible for theirs. Counties are responsible for theirs. Um, I know the state hates it when the federal government mandates something on them, so they shouldn't be doing the same to us. Chuck. Yeah, this is the same situation. They do this to push it off to the cities and counties, and that, so they can pat themselves on the back and say, well, we kept your taxes more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're going to make the cities and counties tax their people instead of being responsible in paying for the stuff that the city, that the state's supposed to be. And you know that's a gr that's a great point. HERF is a, the Highway User Revenue Funds. HERF, uh, that is a gas tax. You already pay it. It goes to the state, and they're supposed to redistribute it back to cities, towns, and counties, while they keep it for road repairs. Yeah, they, well, they take out a percent, but they're doing more than that. They're actually taking the amount that was supposed to be redistributed, and they're keeping it. And, Right, but what? But here, but to, to your point, here's what we're seeing happening, and maybe this was the grand plan. We're now seeing cities, towns, and counties go. You know what? Maybe we need to implement our own gas tax because we don't have enough money anymore to fix our roads. And maybe that was the grand scheme of things by the state to say, well, eventually we want to just keep all of this money and let cities and towns and counties figure it out for themselves. Well, that's not what the taxpayers agreed to in the beginning. It was supposed to be a redistribution in your right. We used to get uh, SLIF, State Lake Improvement Funds. That was a portion of that gas tax that was attributable to boats filling up. And guess where they fill up the most? Lake Havasu City. One third of all boating days in Arizona happened right here. Right here in this small community. So there was a fund that averaged somewhere around five to six million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And we used to get a piece of that to help build improvements <coughs> along the lake. Um, and then those improvements then actually brought more tourists in that spent more on the gas tax, etc. Well, they took all of it. It's funding, we don't get it's any fund, of it Funding anymore. state parks now. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's funding another state agency. Yeah. And your road improvement <laughs> funds, your HERF dollars, those are funding DPS now. So it's, I mean, the, the, as the mayor said, the cost is the same. We all pay it at the pump. But it, the original intent of those taxes or a portion of those taxes was to come back to the communities uh, to, to fix the roads and, uh, to, and the part attributable to boating would go into um, improvements that improve boating. Well, you know, the boating money is now going to state parks and the road improvement money is now going to fund DPS. Right. So it's a, it's a lottery, shell game. And lottery money got swept too. Lottery, they used yeah. to go to transit, that got swept too. Right. Nothing against Sunny or, or any of the rest of our Right, and, and they need to do that. They need to look out for us too. Yeah, look out for us. And uh, Regina Cobb and and, and Senator Borelli, when it comes to the Herf restoration, etc., have been uh, huge supporters. But you got to remember the way it works at the legislature. It's uh, they always go by the numbers: 31, 16, and one. You need 31 reps, 16 senators, and the governor. And you don't get those you don't get what you want. And so uh, they have been um, supportive, but it, it's just strange how it works down there. <laughs> There's a lot of horse they, trading. They never undo what they've done. That's the uh, it's, it's been difficult, to say the least. Um, yeah, and we can whine about it. I mean, there's, you know, all the cities and towns and counties are sharing in the HERF misery but uh, Lake Havasu City is, uh, I think, disproportionately 
punished, if you will, with respect to the SLIF dollars, the, the boating money, because right. m over half of the SLIF monies came from Lake Havasu. Right. So w with that money going to fund Arizona State Parks, I think we're carrying a disproportionate share of the load on running state parks because they're using money that's generated right here in Lake Havasu. Right. So it's, uh, is it fair? No, but you know, we, just, what it is. we need to get that message out. And you know, the communities across the state that, uh, that don't uh, contribute to or have uh, access to those SLIF monies, they don't care about our plight SLIF-wise because they don't have a dog in that fight. So it, it, it can be difficult for communities like ours that right. are carrying a disproportionate share of the load. Yeah, you get a representative um, that's in a community that doesn't have a waterway or whatever. They, they don't, you're, Charlie's right, there, there's no dog in the fight for them. It's like, well, you know, sorry, but Why I've got other care? issues yeah. to deal with. Um, so that makes it uh, a little more difficult. But you know what, we're managing, we're gonna, we, we uh, the League of Cities and Towns there's a league of cities and towns. We continue to um, make our desires known um, that we really want to get back to the way it should be, and that is every pot of money should go to where the taxpayers intended it to go and not keep doing all these sweeps. I just, want to, I just want to say that coming through um, this horrible recession that we get, Having the uh, leadership of the great mayor and the city council and 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 Charlie, our city manager, with his staff, you know our city's in great shape yes. compared to how so many other cities are bailing their way out. So we're very very fortunate to have these individuals that have really taken good care of our cities. Well, I think what we uh, well thanks. <clears throat> Well, again, what we've tried to do is just be um, smart and be smart about the way we spend the money. And we knew that, and I've, we've had this conversation before, we knew that when the recession started, it wasn't going to be a one or a two year problem. And so we immediately took action because it, it was pretty clear it was going to be a long term recession. And uh, we've made the adjustments. In fact, it was, it's interesting. We were looking at head counts of the city um, yesterday as part of the budget. And our head count um, before the Great Recession was in the mid 500s. And today it's still around 440. And we don't see any reason to have it go back up because of the reorganization Charlie did to make the, the departments more efficient. And so we were able to build reserves during the Great Recession and now that now we can't spend them and now we yeah now because of the expenditure limitation we can't spend the money um but now we're able to we've built enough reserves that for people that, or community members that have says we really need to have an improvement to a park or whatever we're able to do that now and so we have a long list of things that we're trying to achieve. We still have more projects than money, though. We do have more. Every, all the time, you're going to have more projects than money. That, that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's something that happens at home. I mean, we all have more projects than we have money. Um, we, you know, when we had to come back from Denver, we did have to transfer through uh, Las Vegas. We did think about putting the $2 million on red to see how it worked out. <laughs> But we, it would have been tough to explain if it we turned up we black. Couldn't, we couldn't cash that big cardboard check. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway. All right. What other questions do we have out there? Chuck. Compared to last year's budget, uh -huh. to this year's budget, the revenue has gone up how much and are we any more, any more of that, or are we going to just go ahead and spend all that? As well, far as, as far as the yeah. revenue, like if we had like a fifteen million dollar budget last year, we got a, a nineteen million dollar budget this year. Is the revenues up to, to be able to do that? And well, revenues um, are up over the prior year and uh, up over a little bit over but what we had budgeted. 
expenditures are less than we had budgeted. It's almost like it's like that every year. We we kind of budget for a worst case scenario, and, it, and the expenditures are always less. Um, we will be dipping into um, fund balance to build some of these new parks. Um, because again, remember, we built up the reserves. So you either spend those reserves on what the community wants or give the money back. And so we're now in a position to to fix up Cypress, to uh, redevelop Sarah Park, and, and do a number of other uh, projects. And so we will, using some of that fund balance, but we'll still have an incredibly healthy fund balance when all is said and done. Our wastewater fund is doing well. Our water fund is doing well. So uh, yeah. we're sales, not concerned. Yeah, sales taxes alone are, are up about 6%. Um, but the increase in expenses um, that we really don't even have control over, Correct. like the public safety pension, you know, that's uh, the, the um, public uh, retirement personnel retirements, PSPRS, public safety personnel retirement system, PSPRS. Uh, you know, we have a $56 million uh, underfunded liability or unfunded liability that we need to deal with. That doesn't mean that we're uh, in trouble by $56 million. That just means that if everybody retired today that's entitled to draw on that retirement, uh, we'd be $56 million short on meeting those pensions. Um, obviously, those th that takes place over time. It's kind of like Social Security. It's not something that all comes home at once. But it is something we have to carry on the books as an unfunded liability. Um, that the, the city's participation in the public safety retirement system alone uh, is gone up by $1.6 million uh, just in this year. And it will go up again next year and the year after. Uh, because of, of these underfunded or, or unfunded liabilities that, that we share with just about every other city and town in, in Arizona. In fact, many uh, communities across the United States have similar uh, retirement pension issues. So, uh, so a lot of, and the, the minimum wage uh, going up, the uh, requirement for sick leave uh, for even part-timers, uh, uh, that, that's gonna add a quarter of a million dollars a year to our expenses that we didn't have before. And these are all things healthcare. that, they, yeah, cost of healthcare, our, our, our employee increase. benefit trust has gone up almost 6%. And the, and the employees also contribute to that as well, but it is also an increase to the, the city's operating costs. So a lot of these increased expenses have outstripped that, you know, yes, we have, we have favorable uh, tax receipts, sales tax receipts, and yes, uh, the community is uh, well off financially, but we can't really enjoy the fruits of a lot of those labors because of these other uncontrollable costs continue to go up uh, that we have to deal with from year to year um, uh, in, in spite of what our sales tax receipts might be. Yeah, now when it comes to public safety, because um, I get this question periodically, well, why did you let it get so bad? We made every contribution we were required to make. Every dollar we were required to make, we did. But we have no control over the legislature adding additional benefits that without our say that we have to ultimately pay for we have no control over the fact that quite honestly the fund manager for all of those funds uh, did not uh, produce the investment returns that they said they could do um, and and to their credit guess what, the stock market is, you never know. So in the end, I just want everybody to know, we didn't create a $56 million problem because we made every payment we were supposed to make and then some. It's just all these other factors have increased it. Now we do have a plan to deal with it. We're gonna to try to, uh, we're, we're gonna make a $20 million contribution um, so that it gets to about a 65%, I think it's 20 million, mm -hmm. uh, 65% funded. Uh, right now we're uh, under 50%. 44%. 44%. Have a sue alone. Have a sue alone. Oh yeah, across the state it's billions. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Prescott has a 70 plus million dollar shortfall. Okay. Yeah. So, so we're we into switching over. I've, I've heard the county wants to switch over to a different plan for their people, you know, for the sheriffs and, and stuff like that. Well, yeah, well, they, they can't just exit. <laughs> no, not exit. They yeah. have to keep the people on it that's on it. But right. Well, no, there is a now, it's called a, uh, a tier three tier plan three, right. that was passed for all new uh, personnel that will help to some degree. Um, but we're going to make a $20 million contribution uh, using um, debt financing because the rates are so low that we actually believe that um, the amount we would have to contribute would go down enough that the differential could pay for the interest costs. So that's what we're working on right now is to find that sweet spot so that we are at a much higher funded liability or funded uh, pension plan and yet not cost us any additional money. Exactly. Do it now while the rates are incredibly right. low. And so our finance director is working on that. And with the expenditure limitation, uh, debt is really the only way that we can defease a lot of these things because debt is exempt from expenditure limitation. And that's a great point, too, because we're being told that if we wanted to do that $20 million just out of our own reserves without using debt, that we would violate the expenditure limitation. So you got one, one law that says you need to fund these liabilities and the other law that says if you do, you've just violated the expenditure limitation. So we really have no choice but to do it via debt. Because that is the workaround. Proverbial rock and hard place. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, I don't know somehow. We'll get it taken care of, we'll, we'll do it. But we will, yeah, we're, we're not, you know what, if we could solve <laughs> the sewer debt issue, yeah. we can easily solve this <laughs> uh, because that was much, much more complicated with yeah. probably about 20 different moving parts. We've slayed bigger dragons than this. Yeah, that's right. So. <laughs> David. We just got the new water slide for the kids. How do you like it? They oh, love man. it. Oh, wow. Um, have you gone down yet? I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> So how'd you like it? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> and it held up. That's great. Yeah. yeah, we do have a new water slide. Uh, we went to the grand opening. David went to, as well. And, uh, and boy, the kids just absolutely love it. it it's so much better because it's, it's not dark in the tube. It's, yeah, it's, it's brighter. It's much brighter, and the kids are loving it. Um, and we're doing a number of other improvements to the aquatic center. That aquatic center is close to 25 years old, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, and so it, uh, we're spending how much? Well, we Half took, million? We took some of that out of the budget there. Uh-oh. So we won't talk about that. But uh, yeah, the, the water slide is great. <laughs> it, it, in fact, I'm hearing from the people that work at the aquatic center that there's actually people coming in off the highway to investigate the aquatic center that have never been there before yeah. because through the translucent tubes yeah. outside, they saw people the sliding, uh, and and were interested enough to find out more about it. Taken out the, the water slides throughout the country because of that guy in Fullerton that was 360 or 70 pounds that went through the wall of the tube and <laughs> killed himself by cutting himself open. And nice. Oh, no. Well, hopefully and that will never happen here. Well, our water slide is very popular, and now it's nice and new and bright. Good. It's got those translucent sections in it, so the sunlight can yes. come in. It's very bright, and uh, uh, they can turn it up pretty high now. So the, the, it, uh, it's a pretty exciting ride compared to what it used to be. So. Yes. Other questions? I don't know what time it is, but oh, we're doing good. Chuck. Um, are they going to do anything about the ozone and stuff like that in here? Because uh, we were talking to our uh, insurance agent, and her daughter, every time she goes in there, she has a problem two or three days later with sore throat, ear infection, stuff like that. And I don't know if are we talking about the aquatics? Uh, At the aquatic center? Yeah. You know, the, it, it, it can be the ozone because our ozone system has been down for months. Uh, 
I can't can't answer that. I mean, I'll I'll ask. We have we have certified technicians that monitor the chemistry in there. It should be right in balance. I mean, that's something that we're you know we're very careful about. So yeah, we're trying to we'll deal with the it. high humidity in there. And yeah, that's the yeah, high one of the yeah. yeah one of one of the improvements that that is still in the budget at the aquatic center is to um, to look at the uh, air handling system that's in there and kind of bring down the humidity and, and take care of some of that environmental uh, condition that's in there. They call that the natatorium. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, that term, but since we've been dealing with the, the pool area of the aquatic center, technically that's called the natatorium. So if you hear that term, that's what it is. Jim. You know that's troubling, um, but you know we have hundreds of thousands of people right. using yeah. the facility, and this is the first time I've ever had a report like that. So, yeah. But we'll we'll check and make sure that. Yeah, it's still. Yeah, they're all there. Yeah, everything's still there. Nothing's changed. It's got that beach kind of area where you walk in and all the rest of it. And then we've got the splash pads that are out outside. Those were redone a couple of years ago. So. In fact, they've uh -huh. they've added um, on the the beach, the walk-in beach part of the the main pool. There used to be a couple of little fiberglass, you know, shipwreck kitty slide things. Um, they, the, the mounting systems started to rot out on those or rust out on those, so those have been removed. But they replaced them with um, kind of fun kinetic sculpture things, kind of like what's in the, the splash pad outside. The buckets that fill up and then they tip and they, they pour water out. And so now there's five or six of, of those kind of kinetic sculpture, fun water splashing, spilling things that are along the edge of the pool now that, that uh, were just recently added. So. It's, it's even more fun now than it used to be. But no, we haven't taken anything away. It's all, it's, it's, it's all. Those water guns in there. The, water, the, the water, water guns are outside. outside. Those yeah, are outside. Those are outside. What else this morning? Wow. Right. I yeah. plan to live forever. So, <laughs> yeah. so far, so good. Yeah. I lived to be a hundred the hard way. I was a leader, baby. So, that will be an accomplishment. <laughs> Construction there yet? Uh, um, is there anything no, in permits? You know, Chuck, that's a good question. Now, phase two of the foothills is being processed now, so that you, you know you've mm -hmm. always already seen construction, roadway construction. Uh, but as far as the two parcels that were annexed, honestly, I I don't know what the status of those is. I have not been informed that we've received uh, any plans in for plan review. 
Uh, in fact, I haven't even seen a subdivision plat yet for those. So those lots may not, you know, officially exist yet. So uh, I, I don't want to comment any further because, I, again, I don't have enough or any information about it. Now, were they both, uh, can I know there was one was, I think, Campbell's and one was somebody else. Were they both annexed into the city? Right. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, by the way, something um, that I've gotten a few questions on, and I'll try to explain it was in the paper the, uh, maybe last week, um, about a new traffic light that's going to be down by the, what we call the old Walmart. They call it the North Shopping Center. I've never heard of it referred to as that Staples. before. Uh, but it, we, we're the old Walmart, and now Staples is out. This, this traffic light will be um, just south of Staples. We really, um, this is a, a new project by ADOT. And um, here's why we um, wanted them to put a additional light. Um, they're gonna be putting a middle uh, median um, on south of Kiowa and north of Kiowa because most of the accidents along that highway take place right there, people trying to make left turns and crash. Um, and there are serious crashes. So they're gonna, in an effort to make it safer, they're gonna put a, a median going down the middle of the highway. But the problem with that is that that left one access into that shopping center, and that is if you make a left turn on Kiowa. Um, and so then you'd end up backing traffic up trying to get in. So we said, you're gonna need another access point. So we really wanted them to put it behind Staples. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's a huge wash back there, not enough room. It, it, it just, the engineering cost would have been astronomical. So it wasn't gonna work. So then they put it, they're gonna put it just uh, south of, or kind of toward the front entrance of Staples. It at least it gives us an additional access point for customers wanting to use that uh, that mall. So we hope that when they're all said and done, it will be uh, a whole lot safer. It is going to definitely be better than what they had proposed, which was a roundabout. <laughs> which, yeah. yeah, I was I was disappointed. Yeah. The second driveway. What's that? It's going to be the second driveway, the one where. Is. No, it'd not be the one where it's not. It'd no. No, no, it'd be further north. Yeah, of, that that driveway. Well, no, that driveway where the Clark Realty is. That that access will be closed. Oh. Wow. And the inter the new intersection will go in basically where the driveway is now in front of Staples. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So that. Um, yeah, you know, we hated to see another traffic light because we have so many as it is, but, uh, you know, we've got to keep people safe, too. And if, and if we make that left turn lane too long, then you'll start seeing people going through a red light. Yeah. So then it defeats the purpose. So um, this was, uh, we hope that when it's all said and done, this middle lane or middle median will prevent a tremendous number of uh, additional accidents. We're also going to be doing it, um, now this is a city project, that is an ADOT project, uh, along Lake Havasu Avenue and McCulloch Boulevard. Yes. Um, the, uh, again, a lot of left turns, illegal left turns out of there, whether you're coming out of the various uh, stores there. And uh, so we're going to be putting an island there as well. And um, because that will be a little safe. And then I think, but the difference of ours is we're going to be doing some landscaping along with it to kind of make it prettier mm -hmm. along that. That was the other question. When are they going to start that? You know, can I, they're going to redo the whole thing from Swanson to the ski. Right. What, do you know what the start date is? I, I'm sorry, I don't. Yeah, I, it's, I, I think it's not until next year. It'll be budget. after July. Yeah, but I, after but July. I, yeah, I even thought it was But how too. long after July? Yeah. I honestly don't know. I remember we were just talking about the council meeting and we were just talking about how they're going to shut you know, they're going to have to do half of the road and stuff like that because they can be it is, it is, hard to shut down. It's going to be a logistical, uh, 
the, yeah, the only thing I know for sure about that project is we, we will all be very glad when it's done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, um, but, um, you know, yeah, and I think it is gonna be extended for a while. I think what will relieve some of the traffic is when the Havasu Riviera actually opens and the new launch ramp on the south side of town, that will alleviate some of the traffic trying to get across onto the island. So that it, uh, it will finally be able to disperse some of that boat traffic. So, Can they say about a year from now? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, that's their plan is about this time next year that it will be open. Um, so we're, we're hopeful. Anything else? Steve? I'd just like to say uh, how nice it was for the Desert Storm Street party last night to go nice and smooth. It did go smooth. Yep. And, uh, yeah. Some nice boats. Yeah, beautiful boats. It was nice uh, not having to worry about uh, anything on the park getting broke or <laughs> smashed or traveled. Uh, oh, that was real nice. Oh, you didn't read the contract? <laughs> you have uh, 60 days after it closes yeah, to be yeah. responsible. <laughs> so, I don't know if anybody saw it yesterday. We were down there, but down on London Bridge, uh, Fox Town 10 for Phoenix. Mm -hmm. for their oh, right. show. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. Promoting a lot of stuff in our city. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see them actually mention the fact that we got second place in the ABC contest, yeah. and I've yet to see it. So, no, we, but we sent out pr press releases, didn't we? Yeah. 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 I found out about it on Facebook. I would like to see it because they're in Bullpen today. They're off. I've seen them gone to Laughlin yesterday. He's not here on the Friday. He's going to cover the whole thing on the motion. True. Anything else? All right, just a reminder, June 2nd uh, will be the next coffee at Sam's Place. Bring a friend. Bring a friend. Thank you all very much. Appreciate Thanks, everybody. It.